Hi, Dessa. Hey. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Of course. So, as I was saying before, when Dara said I wasn't allowed to speak yet, how much mileage did you get out of being on the Hamilton mixtape? How big was that for you? It was a big deal. I wait, think- wait. For- Sorry. Oh. I feel like I sound like an asshole by opening this conversation asking you about that because you've done so many <laughs> other things. Right. You meant to ask it as an aside before we started and yes. I stopped you. Okay. But right. Because it's, be on, cause it's mentioned on the sticker that's on your album. Of your new album. So this was not totally unprompted. Okay. But now you have to answer. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, I think... I think here in New York, particularly, like where uh, where Broadway lives, like it, it right. resonates uh, quite a bit, yeah. and then maybe like a little tiny bit less in Missoula. Okay, Do you know <laughs> what I mean? Fair. Yeah. yeah. So. Although uh, that's funny, that album was so big, though. Hamilton. I mean, there is. It's it's like impossible to overstate, mm. uh, at yeah. least in right. my experience. I mean, but, I mean, the reach of people who haven't even seen the show. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, because the, cause the cast recording and, and the mixtape right. was so good, you know, right. so it's like from from Sydney, you know, to London, yeah. to Prague. I mean, there's no overestimating. To New Yorkers who can't afford to go see that. Right. Exactly. <laughs> I can't believe neither of us have seen it. Have you seen I it? I can't believe you haven't seen you it. You have. Oh, ready, ready, ready for the insufferable boast? Yeah. yeah. Three Go-fer- times. What? Fuck yeah. Because yeah. of being on the mixtape? Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. But how did you get Never on the mixtape? Um, let's see. I had first um, seen a note, or no, I, I think I had initially received a text from a friend. It was like, yeah, okay. uh, Lynn mentioned one of your songs on a very long list of songs that he was listening to. Oh, cool. Yeah, around the time of writing Hamilton. So enormously, what? enormously flattered. Which song? It was a song called Dixon's Girl. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then wow. I hit him up on Twitter. Well, that's the place to that's find him. Place to find him. He spends wow. a lot of time on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Oh, was that about me and you? Yeah, a little bit. That's how okay. we met. Was, yeah, on yeah. Twitter. was it? Yeah. 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 yeah okay. Best friendship. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. Okay. It's cute. Um, wow, that's crazy. So, so you tweeted at him. Uh huh. Was he following you? Was it a DM or just a straight at? I, I, that's a good. That's a good question. I think I'd have to review my like Twitter history in the you way back to, machine you or whatever. You for, de- for DM. You do, but yeah. I can't remember if I first had to say like, "Hey, hey. thank you." Yeah. Yeah. Hey. hey. In my yeah, Ronda voice. Like, right. I heard you like me. <laughs> it's just horrible. Let's move. No, I, he was so he was really kind. He. Uh, he was and really generous and he's I think in, in almost everything he does man he's been super eager to you know receive some of the intention and the accolades that he does and yeah. then find cool ways to distribute to the art that he likes whether that means right. making a you know a, a playlist on Spotify and yeah. sharing that regularly mm-hmm. and he's you know you can you can hear it in every interview he does I mean he mentions his collaborators and the artists that he's working with so right. he lived really up supportive. to that hype yeah he, yeah he is he lived up to that hype in my interactions with him. it's cool I didn't know about the mixtape and I just love that of course this Broadway musical that's a hip-hop musical then lends itself to having this like hip-hop format for like another whole selection of music like that's it's just yeah. really cool yeah super yeah. rad mm-hmm I mean, uh, I feel like people who are really into Hamilton want to hear the story all the way through. So then what was recording that song like? <laughs> okay, I just want to sure, finish sure. it for yeah. the people who crave it. Of course. Yeah. Okay. So um, so we initially connected on Twitter uh-huh. and I got to see the show and um, I had been prepared to enjoy it, but I hadn't prepared <laughs> the right way. Mm-hmm. Meaning? Because I had I'd been prepared to see this like masterful triple threat you know performance where these people can sing and Uh act and dance in corsets and I was excited about that and I was also excited to see how this really like there's a really serious expository burden right like you have to get across a lot of information yeah Yeah. whose song is congratulations um it's not in the actual oh it's it's not not, mm -mm. no but it's um it was sung as a demo by Renee but anyway, yeah. so I was like, I went to the show, and, uh, and I was braced for all that stuff. Like, wow, how's it going to work, yeah. you know, all of this history into these lyrics? And uh, I'm excited to see these A-listers perform and blow my mind. And I had not been ready for, like, a really uh, a really tragic love story. And so I oh, ended wow. up just, like, losing wow. my shit. You yeah. know, I'm just, I'm like, yeah, I was just crying yeah. <laughs> during mm. the second act because I hadn't known to brace for it. It was so 
beautiful. Yeah, so right, there's moving. that even on top of like That's all what I mean. the spectacular, like yeah, musical and like other performance wise. But I hadn't you know, cross trained for that. Right, right, right. right, right I yeah. wasn't ready. For, I was embraced for yeah. that, man. <laughs> um, and so it really, really affected me. And yeah. I was like, wow, what a Jeez, what a master work to, to do all of this. Yeah. Like everyone else. Surprise, yeah, yeah. surprise. I like Hamilton. Everyone no, does. No, I feel very validated by that because mm. I was out to dinner last night with a friend who's a lawyer and she was telling me, telling me about seeing Hamilton and that she had mixed feelings about it because she wasn't sure that it was presenting federalism in the right way and that she was worried people were going to misunderstand Hamilton and exactly what he did. And I was like, I don't <laughs> really think that's what that musical is about I haven't seen it but I've listened to the soundtrack but yeah. I think it's about much bigger things than that and she was like really and I was like, she you said saw really? the show she said, really what did you get <laughs> yeah I was like come on like uh helpless and satisfied like those are about right, so everything those focusing are like on a the twin experiences stuff, of but... love yeah anyway yeah I mean, I'm I'm also impressed by your caliber of friend, though. Like, what a statement! Like, I'm concerned about the misrepresentation of federalism. I can hang out with I, a lot of friends for a long time before that's the comment I come up with. Well, I can add nothing to that conversation. Yeah, okay. We have to change subjects very immediately. Quickly. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Would you yeah. ever want to be in in Hamilton? Hamilton? Um, the honest, and it's not the honest appraisal is I don't think my skill set is like well matched for that. Why okay, not? but if you were, would you wait? Be but Angelica, I, but I would also Eliza want or Peggy. No, everyone go around and. <laughs> Just uh, I wish I knew not? the show well enough. I uh, yeah, well, I I would want to uh, disagree. Not being you. What if but we, being what a if fan we fight that what you think we, that she should be? Yeah, in no, but I think your skill set oh. is is you know well matched. I mean, so the reason in part is like I you know having spent all of my career to this point primarily presenting my own material yeah. in a way that allows me. Like the skills I've developed are room reading, meaning like I know when the, a room of people is getting bored or needs us. Like this is proving Dara's point. But you're not allowed to change course but you, in a Broadway play. Okay. So and you're not allowed to. And right. That's one of my best skills is right. like I know I can see how many people are texting. I know when the chatter at the mm. bar gets louder. I can tell how many times the till has gone off. Mm. I know when the boys and the girls are noticing one another. What like, do you do in those circumstances? I, how I, do you course correct? Or? So, I'll, so maybe it depends if I'm playing with a live band. I do a little signal behind my back that says, can you increase the tempo of this song? Or I'll put my left arm, I'll extend my left arm and I'll look to my right so that it feels like to the people who are watching there's energy being beamed both ways. I'm attending to you. I see you. Or sometimes I'll say uh, with my left hand, I'll kind of do a, a motion that implies I'd like the crowd to back up. And then I'll just jump the barricade and jump into the crowd. Say, hey, let's, wow. let, let's get into this. We're here. Let's be alive right now together. I can't. That's not going to help. At him. So it's such a huge part of this for you is the actual interaction with the audience you're not saying to yourself i'm gonna go out give it what i got they're gonna give me what they've got but i can't control that and i can't worry about that you worry about that all i do is worry <laughs> wow <laughs> so much so I that you'd say i wouldn't want to take my rapping and my singing and mm. those skills to hamilton because i couldn't if no. they got bored with me i would be stuck but i'll say i mean not that it's always a zero-sum game but like i'm really good at that first thing i said and yeah. i'm you know and i'll boast about it and i'm a good writer and stuff but i don't have a broadway at this point i don't have a broadway singer's pitch i mean i just don't those <laughs> because they're so accustomed to working in big vocal ensembles right. where everybody's got to be you know absolutely razor sharp and i think i'm a good performer but it's sort of a it's different a, i understand that. you know it's, what i mean yes. Yeah, yeah. It's different. yeah. What's your ideal room to perform in? Like kind of room? Hmm, that's a good question. Uh, I do like, like for me, um, having been, having kind of cut my teeth with rap guys, um, I can't like jump and sing, you know, like I can get really, really athletic. So I do depend on lights to mm. help me convey um, emotion, you know, whereas mm -hmm. like some of the dudes in Doomtree can just like, you know, like, pogo essentially yeah, and yeah. They would, they're gonna hate me we don't pogo dude but can <laughs> can jump and move in like a somersault and headbang and everything and i while singing don't do that so i rely more on like when to lift an eyebrow and when to curl the fingers slowly into a fist huh. you know and when to lean forward slowly and then jump or that kind of stuff so i, I rely on light mm -hmm. a lot so good yeah. light um mm -hmm. i do like a stage height that allows for line of sight so if people want to stand up they can still see uh -huh. you know which uh -huh. you can't get on like a foot high stage or something yeah 
And um, and I would say that it's probably not good for the bottom line, but it's good for the feeling to be in a room where that's small enough right. that if I decide to put down the mic for a second, I can yell and be heard. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which you can't do in a room of 5,000, which you can do in a room of 800. Yeah. So let's talk about Doomtree. Start with that a little okay. bit. Let's do it. Let's do it. This is a collective, you and six dudes. Right. Is that right? Yeah. Um, and my understanding is that <laughs> the way that you've put it is Doomtree is about friendship first, hmm. music second, money third. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no contracts. Right. Just <laughs> friends agreeing <laughs> to do this together because you love it. Right. And you've been doing it for 10 plus years or mm-hmm. so. And it's been sustainable. Sustaining, you've tra- you've played 8,000, you know, cap rooms and stuff like that. How does that function, first mm. of all, <laughs> in, in an industry? Because you're well known, you, you, you know, you're doing it. Um, but that just sounds like the exact opposite of something that would function, yeah. you know, well. And then I want to talk about the idea of you being in a, in a collective with six dudes. That's right. right, right. <laughs> How does this function? I mean... I was type A enough that when I first joined, I was like, let's be clear, this is not functional. This will never, you know what I mean? We have to have contracts. And, yeah. and I got these books from the library and I made a Venn diagram and PowerPoint. I mean, I, I went in. I love a Venn diagram. I do too. Very yeah. satisfying. I know. <laughs> and I had like these complicated, you know, simple, but simple algebraic equations, but relatively complicated for a rap meeting about like <laughs> how I thought the compensation models would work and the appropriate terms of commitment. But at the end of the day, like if you don't want to be here, you should, we should let you go and you should leave and you should yeah. find a place that you do want to be because you're an artist and I like you. Yeah, that sounds great. And you know? to be clear, <laughs> there are definitely on occasion like raised voices and tears. It's not like kumbaya. Do you know what I mean? We're not like, yeah. yeah, it's not like we all bring our pennies at the end of, you know, every day and we just put them on the table and then, you know what I mean? And right. then we, we all share from one loaf of bread. Right. I mean, it's not a hippie commune. It's not. It's not hippie. <laughs> it's <laughs> not. Uh, it's a, you know, rap is aggressive rap. and competitive. Yep. Yeah. Um, but that said, it, and we've definitely got spreadsheets. Like, you know, I'm very aware of you know, when we first sat down, I was like, can I see that record really right. quick? Because I want to see how the sticker ended up being printed after we set that. We've got profit and loss spreadsheets for every project we do. Uh-huh. But how much is that you bringing that to the table? I think at the very beginning, it was, you know, I was business minded. But now um, the guy who runs the labels called Laserbeak and... Um, He's the dude. I mean, he, yeah. When I want to spend money, it's, hey, be, it's, it's Dessa. Yeah. About those stickers. Yeah. Right. Can I get that gold foil, please? <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Was that hard to relinquish some control to I, someone else? I will say yes. And then I will also say that even the harder thing was to like, uh, was to just realize like how good he is. Yeah. Like he surpassed me. You know, and yeah. I had, you know, you kind of like I had tucked it into my self concept that I'm the like I'm leadery. Yeah. And, and I was like, wow, he's got all <laughs> these leadership skills that I don't have. Mm-hmm. I feel like I'm really good at leading uh, and at following teams of people who are similar to me, mm-hmm. who keep the same hours and who have the same, you know, like work style and stuff. And he's really good at like finding a sh- way to make really varied people work. He's a diplomat. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. So then how is it to be in a rap group with six guys? Mm. Um, you know, I've, y- you've talked about the idea of having to sort of be aware of how you're perceived and that maybe starting out in the group, you were less um, eager to sing as yeah, part of the right. group because then you'd be perceived as the singer chick mm-hmm. and not so much the hard, you know, rapper. Um, and that that is something that carries on. That's something that every musician, every female musician deals with. Every, I think, woman deals with wherever mm-hmm. their, you know, setting is having to kind of put on a hat of like, I'm I'm one of you. Mm. Um, how has that evolved within the group? And do you feel that's, you know, not so much of an issue now? I mean, yeah, that's a good question. Also, can we just do a quick, you're really well researched. <laughs> <laughs> I want to fist bump you, but you're just oh, keeping your hands on Okay. Oh. <laughs> I I was lucky enough to, I think, always receive a really genuine and legit welcome from within the crew. And more than a welcome, it was like, I mean, I didn't know what I was doing. None of us did. We were young. But I didn't know, <laughs> I didn't know what a bar was. 
uh-huh. I didn't know what a measure of music mm-hmm. was. I didn't know. And then when one of the dudes was like, well, how many snares are in a measure? I was like, I can't identify the snare. I can All right. just rap. Let's just take it back for two seconds. How would you get into music and rap then? I wanted to be a writer and I couldn't get published. So then a friend of mine was like, uh, you should go try performing your essays as like a, at a slam, a poetry slam. One of those competitive, you know, it's like you go to a bar, you do a performance uh-huh. of a piece. Right. At the end of the night, the crowd votes and whoever wins gets like 50 bucks. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's that kind of vibe. And it was there that I met the the dudes who um, who would eventually kind of invite me to be a part of the Minneapolis hip hop community. But you weren't writing music? No. Okay. No, I was writing like personal nonfiction narrative essays. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> But as spoken word, it occurred to them that that would work well in music. So I just tried to memorize one of the essays okay. and performed it. Yeah. Or, you know, just, okay, if I can remember. And kind of acted it. Right. Yeah. And they're like, okay, bars. You got bars? <laughs> and you're <laughs> like, bars? Hot bars? Yeah. <laughs> Drinks? <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, but, but I mean, I could, you know, it's like even when I was rapping, though, I was recording rap music. Uh-huh. I just didn't, I didn't know the, I didn't know the terminology. I just knew how to do it, you know? And you had the sort of for lack of a better word, like swag or like the, the, the feel of it. I mean, yeah, I think, I I think, I think I'm both. Like, I think it's like, I think some of the music that I make is, you know, is not swag based. (laughs) And then, and then some is, you know, I I like choral music. Um, I like a great rap pattern. Mm -hmm. And so kind of maneuvering through those worlds. I mean, I'm usually like the nerdiest rapper backstage and I'm the toughest person at the conference room. You know what I mean? (laughs) But, um, but yeah, so in, in meeting Doomtree, I mean, it wasn't just like, hey, I guess you can be in our boys club. It was like, hey, this is rad. Like, you should listen to this. You should try this. What a, Here's a beat. What do you think of this one? You want to try to rap on this one? Um, we were growing together. It was from the outside, right? Th- those were the perceptions that I was managing. It wasn't like, what will the Doomtree guys think of me? Mm-hmm. It was like, what does the rest of the world make of this? Mm-hmm. Set, you know? Yeah. And yeah, I used to wear like, size 16 raver pants and i had a <laughs> pair of white boxer shorts that i would <laughs> that i would wear and then i would fold the top over the raver pants so you knew what was boxers wow. you know and then like Come a on. huge like extra large sweatshirt because i just didn't want any i didn't want to give anybody a reason to dismiss me yep yeah. but then as soon as i, I remember wearing a form-fitting sweater and i got yeah i got a lot of heat a lot of feedback on that and and uh at a now defunct website like somebody wrote like oh i wonder wonder why she got that job and then posted like six wow. pictures of like moments Whoa. where you could see skin anywhere and wow. were like this is 2000 they did like a um like a retrospect like yes. that yeah yeah exactly and even reporters you know i remember speaking with a very well respected publication a national publication like, you know how do you respond to allegations that you have this job only you know, because you're a woman or because you, I dated someone in the crew, which I had. Um, Man. Yeah. Yeah. That's it, just so hard. It, and and I think at the beginning, I spent a lot of time worried about what I didn't want people to think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. But now this far in the game, it's like, what's the what's the raddest thing that you could do knowing that, A, it is easier now that I've sort of made a name for myself and some of the yeah. stuff. Mm-hmm. I'm less worried about people saying, she can't rap. <laughs> you know, she's just dating someone. Well, I put out, right, go listen to the records and if you don't like them, right. I hope you find someone else you do like. Right. <laughs> right. But obviously I know what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah. And so now I worry a little bit less about like forestalling other people's yeah. opinions and just trying to do good work. Yeah. Can I ask why you are the only woman with six dudes? Hmm. That's interesting. It's a lot of interviews. I've never asked that. Um, I mean, there aren't that many women in rap music. I, I, I'm wondering right now, I think probably one out of seven is an overrepresentation huh. of yeah, women yeah. in rap music. Yeah, yeah. It's just by numbers. But also, is it, yeah. well, I just wonder if that's a ratio you guys would like oh, to change. Oh, sure. You know what? We've been, we're at this point, it's fam. You're a group, yeah. I mean, it's 10. No one, yeah. I could be wrong, but I would be very surprised if anyone was ever signed to Doomtree. We're just, Got the it. family we are. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's also a Minnesota based group, right? It is, I mean, yeah. you have you I guess now explaining how you came into music and into rap, it makes sense that you wouldn't say, Well, now I need to go to New York or LA and try to explore this because it really was a family mm-hmm. connection that became like the beginning of your career. So you wouldn't take it elsewhere. Oh, you I never see what you're you know, saying. I was wondering about your your connection to Minnesota. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of pride and a lot of like deep roots that you have mm-hmm. there. Tons of music. You do other music groups. You're in 
you founded the Boy Sopranos, which mm-hmm. is an acapella group. You're in Vocal Essence, right? I wrote for them. Okay, yeah, so uh, you do a lot with like a lot of different kinds of music, but all Minnesota based, it seems. And so it makes sense that that's why that you don't feel like. How do I take my career somewhere else? Because your career is, is there? this group. You know, I'll be honest. I mean, initially when we first started, we did the thing that we saw on TV. Like we made demos and then we sent them to places. Usually those places had addresses on the coast. And then we checked the mailbox every day to see if we won. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So you were. Oh, like, yeah. Like, what do you labels. do if you're an artist? I don't know. You're supposed to record a really good song and then you mail it to someone in a suit. Right. And then that person says you know come and be famous <laughs> like we had very, yeah. you had a- normal ambitions as musicians you didn't say oh the obvious thing will be let's create our own label right. and just do no, it ourselves absolutely not it was right. just like the past of most resistance seemed to be the one that we knew <laughs> about as the standard narrative yeah. but i think like a lot of musicians at that time we were realizing okay well like i used to be a, a teacher at a music school and i was like you know until you get signed Let's say you, you are going to get signed by Sony, you know, whatever. You're indie now, so build your career so that by the time you sit down at a negotiating table, you've got some leveraging power. And I think like a lot of musicians, by the time we actually were attracting the attention of, you know, potential partners, we'd kind of built a lot of the infrastructure that we would have been partnering with people for. Right. It was of necessity that we said, okay, we can't burn our own CDs at our mom's house because we're moving some CDs now. So we should find a company. Could somebody Google a company that makes <laughs> CDs? You know, and and then you know we used to rely on friends who worked at Kinkos or whatever to copy flyers. We uh. should find a printer because he's going to get fired. You know, so yeah. After a few years of just meeting the need, right? We accidentally and then deliberately had built like an independent, internationally distributed record label. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Before you came in, we were talking amongst ourselves about how we identify ourselves when we meet somebody out in the Mm. world as artists, as people who do various kinds of film producing and shooting and directing and writing and just how that can be kind of awkward. And as like your own uh, concept of self evolves, how you start explaining that to people. So I'm curious to know, like back in the early days, how you would have introduced yourself mm. to somebody and right. how the hell you would do it now. Right, and now it, I'm looking at your new CD and on this sticker that we were discussing, mm-hmm. the new album from singer, rapper, and essayist, and I would add, you know, poet, record executive. You know, there, <laughs> there, there are so many things that can be described, mm. that can be used to describe you, so yeah. But which words bubble to the top for you? I mean, this I can't tell if this sounds like careering or not, but it honestly just depends on... Who I'm talking, talking to, to. No, we, That's exactly and how much I want on. to talk to them more. Like, right. If it's a Thanksgiving dinner, <laughs> right. do you know what I mean? I'm like, making music, can <laughs> I have some potatoes? <laughs> and if I'm at a conference, you know, a literary conference, then I'm going to talk about an upcoming book. And if yeah. I'm hanging out backstage, you know, then I'm going to mention that I've got a record coming out. Because it, right. it, it can also feel sort of like insufferably self-aggrandizing to be like oh to know what i do you're gonna really have to sit through <laughs> a hyphenated mess because right. i do a lot of stuff i mean that's just like oh please yeah, yeah. but do you I, feel I do, like I, I a do. true hyphenate oh, is it is that true? a terrible I don't question even know. I, you know I, what i mean like I, usually if, I, if if it feels like i'm talking to someone who actually does want an answer right and, and is willing to like sit for a second yeah i'll say like i work in the language arts so i do music I and i that. do writing and i do some performance i like words and i work with those i love yeah. that <laughs> you mentioned the research that I did, and I will say I did go down a little bit of a hole. Is this a what you tweeted hole. yesterday? I, yes. I would like to pull up your tweet. It was inspired by you. It was inspired by my research. By what you did it my say? Tweet. It was like I. It was, so it was like I enjoyed doing my soul sister's homework. Um, the women we get to meet are so inspiring, and they make me want to be better. And no. I was researching. So now you. I know why she tweeted that. Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. Man, arrow to the sternum. It really. Sweet. And like, I'll say because I went in a direction that you might not expect, or or even notes with my arm. or even imagine would be possible. I watched two videos that sort of led me to a lot of places. One was your commencement speech for University of Minnesota, your alma mater, mm-hmm. and one was a medical talk where you're sort of comparing, contrasting being a musician with being like a medical professional. And I was just kind of blown away by the spectrum of your work and your brain and your thinking and like how you synthesize your different interests and like, you know, the way that you work and think. So 
Um, I have a few things from the question. I have a few few things from the commencement speech that I want to sort of throw back in your face. Oh, cool! And see if you can, if how you feel about the advice that you gave to these graduating students. So you actually, I love this. You left Doomtree's first European tour to go speak at University of Minnesota, which I think is amazing. Mm -hmm. You went there for philosophy, Mm -hmm. which is also amazing. Okay. Um, so one of your pieces of advice was about failure yeah. and you said in surviving failure, you can tolerate the prospect of failure and tolerating the prospect of failure. You become bold enough to become appropriately ambitious. Mm-hmm. I think you're wonderfully ambitious. I wonder how much that advice, the idea of like, I need to be bold in my failure, how much that you feel propelled you to do mm. the things you do now. I hate failure. I think it sucks. I don't, I have not been moved by the kind of like recent cultural branding of failure as like spiritually um, tempering. Like I just think it hurts and sucks a lot of the time. That said, I just don't know how to win big without it. It's just a necessary part of expanding your skill set and trying to have a big, full, amazing life. So I'm not, I don't like it. I mean, and I'm not good at it. And I, and I, I admit that I have like, you know, some notes to myself around my apartment. It's like, you said this on stage, you better do it. You know what I mean? Like (laughs) you better, you better make yourself available to failure because I'll see the biggest hypocrite. (laughs) But I have to, it takes reminding. It takes reminding. Nobody likes to fail and failing publicly is the worst. Yeah. It takes doing something scary. Doing something outside of your comfort zone. Yeah. Can I ask what feels like the most recent real failure that you've endured? Yeah. I mean... Personally, I had a pretty big whiff, like, um, and I don't mean whiff, like, I mean, like, when you miss a ball. Yeah. Is is that called whiff? Yeah. Um, I missed a pitch romantically that sucked, Mm -hmm. uh, and I took a lot of swings. (laughs) Mm. Um, And then professionally, like, I'm recently, like, really struggling to find a, um, a good balance between, like, we talked about live performance, um... I get so into it that sometimes I don't manage the vocal performance. Be- mm. So it feels really awesome when you see it in the room, but the recording isn't as good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I don't know where I want to land on that spectrum. So I've had a conversations with a lot of other singers because I can sing beautifully if I hold still uh-huh. and I can emote if I move. And so, so what where recording on that are you talking about? Like if someone is taking a video and putting it on YouTube? So a lot of shows, like, so right now, like a lot of shows will say, hey, do you mind if we live stream this? And uh, okay. I've been failing, I mean, in a small way to say like, that would be a great look for me. My answer is no, because I think if people just watch it small on their phone and they only get that glitchy audio feed and they can't feel the feeling that maybe it's not my best presentation. Mm -hmm. Um, But I know that the people in the room are moved. I can tell. Mm -hmm. Okay. So how do I, I haven't cracked that nut yet. And there's been some times when I've like, I've gone too far either way. We're like, wow, this sounded beautiful, but it was like a bee in the room. Uh And then sometimes it was like, you know, at the end of the thing, we're all sweating and hugging and crying. <laughs> I know that that was a win. Yeah. And boy, does that recording sound humble. <laughs> mm. Yeah. It's interesting. I wonder if the need or the, the, the desire to have a real connection with the audience, this might be crazy, but is more palpable and necessary in like a more kind of hip hop environment oh. almost. Um, just because it's more naked or something. I don't know. Mm. I just know that... My fiance is a, a hip hop artist too, and and the vocalist, a uh, b- rapper, mm-hmm. and it, he's just so the the crowd reaction, and this is true for any artist, of course, but yeah. the the crowd reaction is so important, and you're not able to change that. He's you know it's you're mm. kind of at the mercy of it, but yeah. um, something about the way you're describing it just makes me wonder about. Well, but Dari, you're in a band. So do you feel like it's different for him I, than it was I, for you? I, I do because, you because when we're in a band being in a group, there's really no way to collectively adjust. Yeah. I mean, we go on stage and you have to say to each other and ourselves, just like, this is going to be the best show. If it's for 10 people who don't care mm-hmm. and are talking the whole time, it's the same show. It's got to be the same show. That doesn't actually end up happening. Uh-huh. We try. But is there banter no... in your show? Like, does I someone was, ever was, talk between songs? Yeah, the lead singer would talk. Okay. Not really amongst yourselves. Though. Not amongst ourselves. And it wasn't as free. It wasn't, it wouldn't sort of shift necessarily if mm-hmm. like the vibe was different. Would your set list stay this fixed? Pretty, pretty okay, fixed. Yeah. Okay, okay. yeah. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't know. You know, it's just, um, 
that's such a an, a a tricky thing to be so tied to to, the, to crowd. The, yeah, the crowd. I mean, I wonder, so I'm going to flip it. I'm going to say, what if it's the case that all of us really care, hypothetically, about the crowd reaction? It's just that in hip hop, there's such a clear litmus test for success. So <laughs> if I do a really good, like I have a cover of a um, of a Springsteen song in one of my records, right? But what are Which we song? Uh, going down? Okay. It's such a good song. But when you play that, when we play that song really well, you know? People are like, oh, that's a good song. I like that <laughs> yeah. song. Yeah, good job. You know what I mean? When you play a rap banger, there is no, there is, there's no parsing of the response. You know if you won or <laughs> right. not because that is... you're, someone's bleeding. You know? Yeah. <laughs> bleeding. Right. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Um, well, tell us about this banger of an album. <laughs> Do you feel good about your vocals on this? Se- segway, <laughs> hey, segway street. You like that? <laughs> I do. I and I. I know there's no other way for me to say it, right. And who's going to say no? Not really. But it's but man, right. it's okay. <laughs> no, I'm. I I recorded this one with a new producer who um who pushed me a lot harder, and I didn't like that feeling at first, because I was like, shut up, I know my voice. You know what I mean? Like, right. I'm a grown uh-huh. woman, I've recorded a bunch of stuff. What and was then, the direction? What was the pushing? Yeah, so, like, even, even it was the same guy, his name's Andy Thompson, and he um, he was the same producer and engineer who did the mixtape, you know? Okay. And Broadway guys and girls have a, gals, oh, Broadway people, have a, <laughs> have, like, really huge ranges. Right. Yeah. Rappers usually stick to about three notes. Yeah. <laughs> and uh and there was one note that was just hello high. And he and I kept missing it. I was very embarrassed. I mean, hitting a high, missing a high note. That's it was your whiff. writing though. That's a whiff that hurts. It wasn't my writing. It oh. was for the mixtape. Oh. You know what I oh. mean? So it was a whiff. Yeah. It doesn't <laughs> sound rad. And I prefer to do that if I can by myself. And I and he was like, you got it. Just keep going. Just keep pushing. Try it a few more times. And I, you know, he was just so like patient and and it felt like great process. And then once yeah. I found a way to do it, I was like, oh, I can hit this note and it sounds better in my voice if I add a little trill at the end. This sounds rad. OK, I'm into this. Yeah. And uh, then when we recorded the record together, it was like, um, yeah, just realizing that very often you record the songs when they're freshest. You haven't, well, you know, you, you haven't had any opportunity to really learn the things. Like, ah, I should breathe here, particularly for rap verses, like when to inhale, um, when to kind of, you know, slide a, a beat, you know, mm-hmm. relax on a rhythm or something. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, something about, and I now I know I'm like, I'm superstitious. Now I'm just like, well, has Andy heard it? I don't want to put it out if Andy <laughs> has it. Like he's an amulet. Um but yeah, I think my vocal recordings on this one are the strongest. And I was exciting also to just learn like you can be a grown up and get way better at a thing that you've done a lot. That was also just like, yeah. no, I want to reappraise mm. the rest of me. Maybe I can learn to like make my bed. And I right. did. <laughs> I like way neater. It applies to everything. Yeah. 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 And you produced on this record too. I did. Very exciting. I did. Yeah. Um, insufferably delighted. I don't know. It's like, <laughs> why the, is it so? Why is it? Why yeah, am why I such a nerd? Why are you so surprised? No, not uh, such a nerd, but why? Are you so why are you so surprised by the ability that you like? To yeah. Oh, you know what? I wonder if I'm getting into some really regressive thinking in my own head here. Um, there are few women rappers. There are fewer women hip hop producers. If I had to guess, although I certainly don't have census data on that, um, it felt terribly exciting to like buy my own beat machine. <laughs> And then probably unlike most rap producers to read the manuals <laughs> like over a course of several I afternoons. Learned. Right? That's great. And my first beat was made from, oh. um, <laughs> from a tutorial. <laughs> from like one of the exercises. And it was like, here's how you use bass. And I was like, well, all right. I do right. like that sound. Okay. Uh, you know, like, yeah, yeah it's 100%. <laughs> like sitting at my kitchen table and drinking, you know, drinking coffee and like making a rap banger while following the instructions in like a very imperfectly written guide that's awesome and then and then i was so nervous to play it for the guys because like doom tree one of doom tree's big strengths is uh they make like killer production and it's weird too so it's not like hey uh we're just very pristine we really know the formula they come out with this really left field stuff all the time it's one of their big strengths they make rap music that, that just veers in unusual directions and so to get like the um I was playing the record on my stupid little like a Bluetooth speaker uh-huh. for one of the producers in Doom Train. He was like, "Hey, what's up? Who, who made this one?" It was like my, it was like the Grinch scene. Yeah. Like my heart grew three <laughs> sizes too big. I was like, "I, I made did. this oh, with Paper Tiger. Awesome. I made it." 
little babies uh, flying away. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think Laser Beak, one of the, the the other executive producer on the record, could see like how. Um, I don't know. It's like the kid who makes mm-hmm. like the macaroni card for her mom. <laughs> like I did it, and so I get it. Yeah, yeah. totally. So you didn't have them produce on this one? Oh, sorry. So um, I had a bunch of. <laughs> to be clear, I only produced like a song and a half. So let's just live with the. Um, but the you had the Broadway part. producer as well. Yeah. So on this record, I had um, Laserbeak made a bunch of beats. Okay. And Paper Tiger made some beats. Cecil Slaughter. And oh. all those people are in the industry. Okay. Yeah. Right. And then executive production, which is sort of like after you've got some of the basic sounds and now you're shaping it, was the was the Hamilton guy. Got it. The guy who helped me with Hamilton, Andy Thompson. And then two of the beats, as we were finishing the record, I knew I wanted some that were more like mid-tempo. Like I had some mean tracks and I had some pretty tracks. And I wasn't really sure in the sequencing how I was going to bridge those. Yeah. So I put a call on Twitter that was like, hey, do you make beats? <laughs> Do you make mid tempo beats that are sample free? Because I don't have a legal department. Right. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Awesome. And then made found a couple that way. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. Great. So as a hyphenate person like you are, will putting an album out feel like any kind of exhale? Or is that mm. just all of a sudden more time that needs to go to all the other things? Oh, I see. Do you mean like is this does this mark sort of like, okay, some work is done. You yeah. can breathe for a second? Yeah. Um yesterday. I announced my first hardcover book. Ooh, with, right. Yeah, with Congrats. Dutton, with it was just as a Penguin Random House. A imprint, poetry so. book. It's a f- hardcover collection of personal essays. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Which are written already. Which are written already. Okay. I just finished copying. That's it. so Amazing. exciting. Thanks. Yeah. Look at how look at how look at how much we sound more like a morning oh, public. Nice. I know. That's exciting. So when collection. you talk about books. Congratulations. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Right. <laughs> so when does that come out? Do you know? I do. That comes out in September. It's called, oh, it's called My Own Devices. Cool. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then in between the album and the book, you'll be touring. Yeah. Right? So we're doing the U.S. and Europe and some Asian dates, too. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. And then what comes after the book? <laughs> I can't say yet. Oh, really? Yeah. Meaning there's something. Something. Ooh, something's something, yeah. coming. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so much to look forward to. Yeah. yeah. Keep us posted. I will. Please. Thanks. All right, Dessa, thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Yes. Yeah.